stuff. So we're going to start kind of with the basics. And again, I think thermal regulation for us is something that we do not understand as well as we probably should. In fact, most of you um, uh, may or may not have heard, I, depending on, on your training, I guess, but um, most people don't uh, know in EMS that, that if you get your temperature somewhere south of 95 degrees, you can no longer clot or you have issues with clotting. And it's something that's not trained in EMS, and I think that's something that should be trained almost on day one that we need to keep our patients warm. We all know that if our, our, our temperatures get cold, that they will you know, we'll vasoconstrict. And if we're bleeding internally, we vasoconstrict. It's not real good. And if we're, you know, if we're too warm, then we uh, send some of our blood out to the periphery to try to cool it down. And in that case, if we're bleeding externally, then that's not good either. But not clotting is a significant, a significant factor. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, I was teaching four um, WMA in Afghanistan. And we were working with the 101st Airborne Medics, and they have a great understanding of trauma, but they didn't have quite the understanding of thermal regulation. And, and I can give you one instance where we were uh, in the aid station, we were waiting for some casualties to, camp to come in, and they had to, uh, it was a guy that was, uh, excuse me, opened up in the abdomen with a gunshot wound, and uh, he had some uh, real difficulty with some shock type problems. They get him into the uh, OR, and they try to open him up, and they want to start doing surgery right away, cross clamp his aortic, you know, going all of that type of thing, and uh, they couldn't do it because... Um, he was, his blood was like Kool-Aid. Um, and as we watched the blood pour out of him, it was literally like a thin Kool-Aid. Um, and that's simply because his, t his core temperature had dropped about 93 degrees. And we don't know officially where it starts. We know that it's somewhere below 95 degrees and it obviously gets worse with, uh, with the coagulopathy problems as you get south of 95 degrees. So if you think about our patients that, you know, in, in the civilian world of EMS, they get these patients that are in these car wrecks. Um, and they're maybe out overnight, or they fall and break their hip, or they fall and break their pelvis. You know, and they have a significant potential for internal bleeding, and then they lay there on the, in the concrete or lay out there in the environment for, for periods of time. They could certainly uh, drop their core temperature below 95. So that really should be something that we should be aware of in EMS. And I think that um, taking care of our patient's heat um, is, is a big deal to us, and, and we should be concentrating on that. So with thermal regulation, I mean, we have to maintain 98.6 degrees. That's what that's what we do. If we go, you know, two or three degrees below that, when we come start to become hypothermic, and the chemical processes don't work, we go two or three degrees above that, and as you well know, we have fevers. You know, and 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 you guys all know how fevers work, so there's probably not a point to go to that. But we know how we gain fevers, but all of our bugs in our body like to live at 98.6 degrees also. All right, so when they start to get there, then the body tries to overheat itself to try to kill those bugs and overheats and overheats, you know, and get those fevers of 101, 102. And then when we break those fevers, when we do kill that bug, that's when we cool off and we cool off by sweating and, and, and those type of things. That's why we have the fevers. That's why when we break the fevers, that's how we feel that way. You know, so, you know, we have to maintain that 98.6 degrees and, and wherever you are in the world, uh, virtually everyone is right around there. Now, you guys, well, as uh, practitioners, you guys know uh, that 98.6 is kind of the average, right? It's not the absolute goal, all right? So at any point during the day, like right now, typically we're a little bit warmer. Uh, in the mornings, we're typically a little bit colder. Sometimes people will run 96.9 as their norm. Sometimes people will be 99 degrees as their norm. But the average across the board is 98.6 degrees, and that's where we're really concentrating on doing that. Now, when we, when we look at... Um, the body, I think, I think this, uh, again, this is Gordon stuff. Um, I think he explains it very well. Uh, if you look at the body as the whole, as the house, okay, um, the body itself, the, the, the outside of the body is, is kind of your house. Your thermostat is the hypothalamus, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly. And then our windows, you think about our windows, and that's kind of like the uh, vessels of our body, right? We basically constrict and, we, and we'll decrease heat loss. That's kind of like closing the windows. And if we want to get rid of heat um, inside the house, then we can open up those windows, and that's phase of dilatation. Our furnace is kind of the shivering. Um, that's kind of our heat production, and that's kind of where we, if you, if you look at things like that, I think that's kind of a good way uh, to uh, really look at the body itself. We have layers, obviously, okay. It's, it's uh, you know, and, and you guys in EMS carrying these heavier patients, obviously heavier Thicker bodies are going to be better off in the cold than the thin, uh, petite people. Okay, the, the thin, petite people will be better off in the summer, obviously, but the, in, the, in the cold, though, the heavier set people 
um, that's that's when it's it's good for them to maintain their heat. So there's kind of the layers there, um, and your and your skin kind of works as you know like the outer layer of the of the house and those type of things. So I think that's really a kind of a good way of looking at it. If we look at the therm the hypothalamus, that's kind of a thermostat. And but if you see where it sits right there in the brain, it's dead center. It's right off the uh, the spinal cord there, right right off the center of the brain. Okay, so um, the problem with that is that the core of the brain there is always bathed in warm blood. Okay, it gets warm blood all the time. It won't sacrifice um, anything um, to you know. It, it'll always maintain its heat as long as possible. So the problem with that is that when we're outside in the cold, you know, the brainstem is always constantly getting warm. So it's got to have some other way of getting its information. And that's the information that gets from the skin. Okay, we'll talk about that here in a second as well. But please understand that this hypothalamus is kind of gets con kind of confused in the, in the wintertime. In the summertime, the hypothalamus can overrule the outer periphery of the body. But in the in the in the winter time, sometimes it's a little bit difficult for the body to understand what exactly it's going through because, like you said, the brainstem is constantly bathed in warm blood. <clears throat> so when we get cold, the typical when we go outside, so it's it's down here in uh, Dillon uh, area, uh, West Michigan here, we're about 40 degrees, 36 degrees. Okay, so it's not too bad. But if we were to go outside. In 32, 34 degree temperatures, so like it is now, and it's you know you get that out there in the cold. The first thing that you're going to do is your body's going to vasoconstrict, okay? And it's it's wonderful at vasoconstriction. I mean, it, it can shut off probably upwards of 85 percent of your circulation to your hands um, and to your legs and stuff like that. So it's really prominent from kind of like the elbows down, and then also a, a little bit from the, sh the elbows up, but then some of the knees up kind of thing. But certainly way on the periphery. It's great for hypothermia. It's not so great for frostbite. Um, and again, if we want, we can talk about that later on. And then we look at shivering. Shivering is, is uh, something that um, we do as a non-voluntary uh, exercise. Uh, and I wish you guys could see me because I would be doing my Bear Grill imitation right now. Okay, because if you see Bear Grill, what, you know, watch some of his episodes. He'll throw his hands up and down and, and move them up and down and try to throw blood to his periphery and stuff like that. Well, we all know as medical people we can't do that. If we could throw blood down our periphery, by the time we walked a mile, we'd have hands that were the size of baseball gloves. So that, that doesn't work like that. And our body's very effective at vasoconstricting and vasodilating and all those types of things. So you really can't do that. All right. So like I said, we vasoconstrict and then we shiver. All right. And that's kind of the big things that we're, we're um, going to do right away as we get um, cold. And you can see the picture here. This is a... Uh, this is a uh, the arteries and, and vessels and stuff like that in our periphery. And you can see how vascular it is. Um, it definitely is good at the uh, shutting the, the peripheral uh, blood flow off. We have something called avian anastomosis, which is the, you know, the, kind of a valve between the arteries and the veins, and they will clamp shut. And that cold blood then will sit there. Um, the problem with that cold blood sitting there is that when we warm these patients up, when we talk about treatment, we have to be very careful with something called after drop. And I'll explain that so you guys understand that because that is a very big deal. In the summer, um, and I don't know if you guys are, what protocols you're dealing with, but my partner uh, that's along here with me today, Michelle, uh, Gavin, uh, we rewrote the policy for heat stroke in West Michigan and, and supposed to be across the state um, because we know that dunking people in ice cold water is a big difference. It will save lives. It'll absolutely save lives and we need to do that as soon as possible with these suspected uh, heat stroke patients. Converse of that, in hypothermia, we cannot do that. If we put these people in warm baths, okay, say like a, like a jacuzzi, it makes sense. You think you you got this really cold person, you want to put this cold person um, into a hot bath. The problem with doing that is something called afterdrop. And what happens is because the skin, the, the hypothalamus is relying on the skin to tell it it's cold, okay, because, again, the brainstem is getting warm blood all the time, the hypothalamus takes its clues from the uh, skin. And when, it, it, when the skin says all of a sudden, hey, I'm warm, it opens up those avian anastomoses. All that cold, cold blood that's in the periphery goes right to the heart, goes right to the, the core, okay? And that's what's called after drop. And when we see something there, we could see somebody that's maybe borderline, or we'll, we'll talk about temperatures here in a little while, but I don't like to give you necessarily numbers because I want you to use something else other than numbers. But uh, when someone is borderline, severe versus mild hypothermia, if you were to take them and put them into a warm bath like that, 
um, you could easily cause them to go into severe hypothermia um, and really cause them some significant problems due to that after, uh, after drop. And we'll show you a slide on that on how significant that really can be there. Um, something very, very dangerous to take these uh, cold patients and stick them into a warm bath like that. So we want to gradually rewarm it, and we'll talk about that some more in the future here. Um, <clears throat> our binaries, obviously, the thermogenesis, uh, as far as the shivering goes, we definitely want to make sure that we are shivering um, to uh, keep ourselves warm. Now, uh, exercise is better than uh, shivering, okay? So if you're capable of moving, then it's better to be moving. However, shivering is something that we'll do uh, involuntarily. We'll, we'll shiver if we're unresponsive or shiver when we're, you know, cold kind of thing. We've all been out there in the cold when we start to shiver. That's because your body senses that it's cold. It's gone through the veins of constriction. That hasn't helped, okay? And then it moves towards the uh, shivering part to try to generate some heat. And if you think about when we uh, or how much heat we give off as a human being, and we'll talk about how we lose heat here in a little bit too, we're, we're about a 100-watt light bulb. Okay, if you think about a 100-watt light bulb that's in your house about right now, we, that's about the, the amount of heat that we're giving off. When we shiver, we're upwards of 300, 400 uh, watts. And if we start to exercise, we can get as high as 500 or 600. So we're really doing some good heat. We're putting off some good heat that way. Okay, so that's, that's a very effective way for the body to do it. But just like every other exercise, maybe some of us out there can run, you know, a mile. Maybe some of us can do five. Maybe a few of us can do a marathon, but maybe not a whole lot of people can do a uh, ultra marathon. Shivering like exercise has a limit, period, and, and your body will start to, to uh, fail um, when it loses its ADP and all the other things that, you know, you need to exercise. So shivering in the short term is great, but it won't last forever. Your body cannot shiver itself um, back into warmth if you continually have a, a cold source around you. So, like I said, like, uh, like exercise, we're definitely um, having some issues uh, with longevity there. Um, so, please keep that in mind with your patients, too. If they start to shiver, then understand that that's a limited thing. And, and that's really, for everyone out there, even if you as, uh, you know, if you're snowmobiling, whatever the case is, if you start to shiver, then that's kind of a warning sign for you to start saying, hey, you know what, I need to put more clothes on, go inside, you know, get out of the wet clothing, those types of things. Um, it's curious if, if uh, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about metabolism. Um, here's a question for you here, um, and you guys can answer this question. It's not on the test, but which drink do you think you would give a cold patient? Now, it's a mildly hypothermic patient. Well, and again, we'll talk about hypothermia in depth a little bit here, but this is the patient that's mildly hypothermic. They're still conscious. They're alert. They, they won't show up. They can still eat for you, but they're cold. They're cold. They're shivering. They, you know, they have the shell core shunt, so they're pale. Their blood's, you know, in their periphery, or in their core, um, and their periphery's getting kind of pale and stuff like that. So, if you had your choice um, to give these people, um, you know, hot, warm water. All right, that seems like a good drink there. Um, alcohol. I'm not sure I'd go with Budweiser, um, but uh, uh, you know, alcohol always seems to be a good answer. Or would you rather, you know, go with cool alcohol, or would you rather go with it, like an ice cold Coke? So, and I know you can't answer me now, um, but there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who answer this in uh, different ways, and, and alcohol is probably never a bad answer, but the actual answer is actually a cold soft drink. Um, and the reason that is is because of the calories. Okay, um, beer has calories in it, has water in it, okay? Uh, I understand that, but also alcohol will cloud your judgments. It's probably not a real good idea to be drinking in a, in a cold environment uh, like that. You know, a lot of people think that uh, – Alcohol is known for its vasodilatation properties. Well, all you do is look at a Green Bay Packers football game in January and understand that they, uh, uh, there's a lot of alcohol being used there, and you'll see the guys out there with no shirts on with a G's painter on their chest, and they're not hypothermic, lo and behold. Um, they're not medical miracles. Um, it, it, alcohol really has some uh, vasodilatation properties, but very little, um, and you'd be able to compensate for that. So really a cold soft drink is uh, actually the most sense, and that's purely for the uh, calories there. Our body needs the calories um, to burn, and then when we burn those calories, we produce heat. Now, the, the ice cold part of it, you know, it's, it, you think, well, why not a warm water? Well, water has no calories to it. And the, the little heat that you could gain from drinking a warm drink is really almost insignificant. Um, you can't really warm the person back up by doing that. They'd be far better off actually um, drinking the Coke that way and getting the calories. But Obviously, the ideal situation um, for people would be like a hot chocolate, a warm hot chocolate. I can tell you up in the mountains when we're climbing and those type of things, if we were to treat casualties that way, a hot chocolate with butter in it um, is a good tasting thing, and people are able to drink that, and, and the warmth does help them 
you know, they, it's a good drink for them. They enjoy it. Um, Tang is another thing. Some of you guys are a little bit older, maybe remember Tang. Um, but then also uh, I use an orange um, jello, uh, the mix with the sugar in it, and I'll take that with me. Um, so if we were to have a hypothermia patient that could drink, um, it's a very high sugar, very high uh, content that way, and you put that in warm water, and that's something that's really pal- palatable to them, and they can drink that readily. So, again, the thing is to get the calories into them, and, and that's more significant than the temperature. So if you think that you can really warm somebody up by giving uh, them a warm drink like that, it's really not that significant. Okay, so let's talk about mechanism of heat loss and how we actually lose our heat. And, again, think about that 100-watt light bulb. And there's a lot of misconceptions with this, um, and, and, and this is where we will – this is how we, we treat our patients. This is how we um, – will successfully manage our, our hypothermic patients because this is really the bottom line. This is what really you guys need to understand with this stuff, okay? When we look at heat loss, we talk about um, radiation, um, convection, evaporation, um, and conduction is, is the big four that we talk about. Now, obviously, respiration is important. And we get that, okay? But you can't stop breathing, um, so you're going to have to have some heat loss through respiration. Now, if you do have some of those balaclavas or some of the more advanced things that you guys are going out in the cold, that can limit some of the heat loss through respiration. And in fact, but again, we can't stop breathing, so obviously we're going to have to, to keep doing that. Um, so we'll talk about the other four in, in great length. Let's talk about evaporation for a minute. Okay, um, Evaporation is something that's very prominent in the summer. We absolutely are very good at losing heat. We are not very good animals at maintaining heat. In fact, we are uh, created, uh, in, in, in whether you subscribe to the, bl- uh, the big global lease or through, uh, you know, through some other means of science uh, based on where uh, man came, mind, mankind came from, most people believe that's Mesopotamia, uh, current-day Iraq, where the average temperatures are somewhere around 85 degrees-ish, right around there, okay? So the human body can stay that way. You can stay outside naked at 85 degrees, and you're not going to have any issues. A thousand miles above that, below, above and below the equator, we cannot survive, which will include Michigan. You cannot survive the winters up here without protection. So you have to have protection from the cold, from the cold. So or we wouldn't survive. You simply couldn't survive outside for long periods of time, um, maybe. All right. So if you didn't have your clothing on, you didn't have a house to go to, you couldn't survive. So our bodies, again, we're, we're geared towards that part of the world, and we really are are awesome at getting rid of heat, and we're, we're not as nearly as good at maintaining our heat. So we are good at evaporation. So we sweat. We put the, uh, the uh, sweat into the atmosphere, okay, and then all those kilocalories coming off there, that's where we get our evaporation. Everyone knows that, okay, and everyone knows that the, the, once we get into the high humidity level, that's why we feel sticky because we can't evaporate um, that moisture out into the, into the atmosphere then. So then the second thing that we look at is uh, uh, radiation. Okay, and radiation, again, is one of those big misnomers that people believe. In fact, if you, if, you, if you ask people where do we lose our most heat, what does everyone say? And everyone's probably thinking the same things for our heads, right? If you look at that 100-watt light bulb, the heat loss that's coming from our heads actually is about 10%, maybe 10 of those watts. And the reason why we lose more heat, I guess, through our heads than, than uh, what we typically do everywhere else is because it's not covered. Usually we're not wearing hats. Um, and if we were wearing hats and had our faces covered with bioclavicles and stuff like that, we would lose a lot less heat through our heads. Okay, so it really isn't nearly as significant. I've heard, you know, multiple people, you know, uh, saying that we lose 50% of our heat through our heads. We lose 75%. I think we some. I've heard people say 150%. So I lose my heat plus half a year of heat um, in the uh, atmosphere from uh, that from radiation. It simply isn't true. Um, most of our heat we lose, um, you know, through Radiation um, is simply because we're just warmer than the atmosphere is, okay? And it's not necessarily more from the head. Convection is a, a, the next one we'll talk about, and convection is kind of a big deal, all right? Now, when we talk about cold water immersion and when we talk about wind chills, it's really the same thing. Convection is air moving by you or water moving by you, okay? Now, the best known vacuum that we have um, is really uh, an absence of air, right? It's a vacuum, the best known uh, I'm sorry, not the best known vacuum. We have the best known um, source of insulation is trapped air, okay, or a vacuum, a lot, a, a loss of air there. So that's why down. That's why you know all those uh, things that we have cooling systems work because they trap air. Um, so they they keep you away from that convective heat loss. 
if you want kind of proof of that, if you look at, if you look at, uh, uh, well, let's talk about it here in a second. With convection, as long as we prevent the, the air from blowing by us, or we prevent the water from moving by us, then we usually can do pretty well. Okay, we can stop that convection. But if you're moving around, throwing a lot of your, your arms around type of things, what you're doing is billowing that or coming out of your clothing system, and it's replaced by, by colder air. So if you think about taking a hot bowl of soup or, or a, a hot chocolate or something down, you take a so teaspoon and you blow that off there. Are you blowing that off there and you're providing, you know, uh, cold uh, air by that? No. What's happening is that you, when you blow that off, okay, you're removing that layer of hot air next to that fluid and you're replacing it with colder air. When you're replacing it with colder air, that, that the heat has to heat that air up and then it starts to cool itself down. So when you go blow on it again, and then you lose that heat that way. So that's how we cool things down by um, blowing on them. We're not blowing on them because we're, our body temperature is so much cooler than what that uh, the, the hot chocolate or the soup is. So that's one of the big things that we have to uh, take care of. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that some more. But you think about our patients out there in these car wrecks, and you think about these patients that are, are uh, you know, laying on the ground type of things. We have to protect them from radiation. We're just putting layers and blankets on them you know, uh, getting something on their heads, all those types of things, and then stop the wind from hitting them, you know, and if they're in a stream, it's far better to be in a still pond than it is to be in a stream because of convective heat loss. Um, so, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second too, but uh, conduction is our last one. Uh, and conduction for us is, is actually when we sit on something cooler or if we are uh, next to a rock that's taking on heat, something that is cooler than our body temperatures. Uh, and our body temperature is 98.6 in the core, but it's only about 90 degrees on the periphery. So anything that's less than that 90, 90 degrees, we're going to give heat to that. So we're going to actually, and like in this picture, here's a guy sitting in his kayak. Um, you would see, you, know, you would actually have conductive heat loss going through the seat, the plastic seat into that plastic boat or wood boat, rubber the cases, and then into the water. Um, and please understand when we talk about water, we lose heat 25 times faster um, through when we're wet, okay? That's why when, when uh, Lake Michigan is at, you know, when it's, when it's 70 degrees outside, you can wear shorts and walk around in a T-shirt, no problem. But if you go into a 70-degree lake, you're going to be cold. And there's no difference in temperatures. Each is 70. But because the density of the water is so much more than the air, um, we really lose our heat. And, when we, uh, and, and remember this for your uh, quiz that convective heat loss and conductive heat loss is our two worst enemies when it comes to um, heat loss in the water. That's how we primarily lose our heat through convection and conduction. Um, so please remember that when you're, when you're having your patients, um, when you're dealing with these people on scene of these, uh, when they go into lakes and stuff like that, when you're talking to them. And we'll, we'll talk about that again too. So there's a little scale here. Obviously we have to have, um, we have to maintain our heat balance. We have too much uh, loss of heat, then we'll, we'll tip that uh, thing, and that's no good for us you know, for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, and we all know that, without getting too far into the anatomy and physiology kind of thing, but we have to maintain 98.6 degrees. If we don't, none of the chemical processes in our body work very well. We start to have organ failure, you know, and, and, and what we like to refer to is if we have cellular death, then we have tissue death, we have tissue death, then we have organ death, we have organ death, then we start to have people death. And that's where we start to see things fail as we get too cold. Uh, so those chemical processes start to slow, and, and we start to have slow heart rates. We start to have poor perfusion. We start to have uh, heart not responding well. Nerves don't respond well. All those types of things happen when we start to lose this uh, heat. So if we, do, if, we, if we take care of those four heat loss mechanisms, then we can certainly make sure that then we're certainly taking care of our patients. Um, we'll talk about mild versus severe hypothermia here in a little while. And some people throw in a moderate um, we, we like to make it a little bit simpler, so we go really with the severe and we go with the mild. Um, but every, in both cases, we're going to make sure that we're not having any more of these heat loss. Um, if we can correct this heat loss mechanism, if somebody's in mild hypothermia, then we can correct them out in the field, um, and we don't, we don't have to worry about it too much. Or we transport to a hospital, and they can correct it there. In this case, you know, we get toward, toward the severe hypothermia, and that becomes a real medical emergency, and we start to deal with things like uh, – monitor problems and, and, and or cardiac problems and those types of things. And we'll get more into that uh, later on in the presentation. Here's a, it's an interesting slide to me, um, and, and I think it makes real good sense. If you look at slide A, um, this person is, is uh, 
in 45 degree or 45.5 Fahrenheit or 7.5 C temperatures. And that's just a, a shirtless sitting there in those 45 degrees. And then you can see the light temp, uh, the light colors there, it's heat loss. Okay, so as that person is sitting there, you can see where the large majority of the heat is coming from. Okay, now go to slide B there, the section B there. That's uh, someone sitting still in water for 15 minutes. And look at that heat loss. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a still water, so it's not a, a, a water where there's a lot of waves or there's a lot of it's a stream going by. So you're not seeing the convective heat loss here. But look at where he's losing heat. And it's typically where those areas that you would see close to the big vessels. Okay. So obviously, look at that person. He's sitting there in, in, in 45 degree water, okay, for 15 minutes, and he's hardly losing any heat at all. Now go to C, and that's someone swimming for 15 minutes. Okay, look at the major heat loss that that person has there. So when you approach these scenes, and just like in Comet Lake and just some of the other stuff that you see, you have somebody that goes through, and we use a, a, someone that's fishing, and they walk out on the ice and they have their ice shanty out there, and you guys get called to this situation. Um, because the fisher, the guy goes in, the fisherman goes in, okay, and he's struggling, and he's, and he's sitting on that, on the edge of the ice on this pond that he's on. Okay, as you guys approach the scene, obviously you're going to do your, your due diligence with your safety and those type of things. I get that. There's no, well, you know, you got, um, but in this case, what we want this person to do is, is, is do slide B right there, and we would want that person to hold still. Now, a lot of people think, well, if I'm exercising, if I'm moving around, I'm going to generate heat. And it's simply not, you're not going to generate enough heat to maintain your core temperature. So you look at B versus C, who's going to lose heat a lot faster, and obviously C. So you really want this person, this fisher, uh, the fisherman, to, to hold still, get as much of his body out of the water as possible, because, again, we lose heat 25 times faster um, when we're wet than we do when we're dry. So we want to get as much of the body as possible out of that water and have them sit still. Okay, if they're on a PFD, if they're, hopefully they have a PFD on, that would be great. Then they keep their heads above water and, and those types of things. Um, and, and if you look at, if you, if you Google Gordon um, Giesbrecht um, and you watch some of his videos, he goes in the water, and you'll see a slide that I'm in the water later on. But you'll see that when he goes in the water, um, you know, on, on what he does and stuff like that. So I'd actually challenge you guys to watch the video. It really makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and and I, I can spell his name at the end here for you, too. But again, we really want these people to not lose the heat, so it's, better, it's far better to sit still in that water than to, to try to run. Right. Now, obviously, if you have to swim to stay alive because you don't have a PFD, you don't want to put your float on. Okay, we talked about all these things here, and I hope you guys have a good understanding of this. Um, you know, we, we, this is how we treat, this is how we get rid of that heat, um, and this is how we maintain our heat. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about mild hypothermia here for a second. Uh, if we have somebody that is fully capable of taking them, taking care of themselves, they're going to be cold. They might be wet. They may be cold. Okay. They might be shivering. Their skin is going to be pale. Okay. From the shell core shunning and the, and the, and the uh, blood going out of the periphery and into the core. Okay. Fine. No problems at all. If they're capable of good rational thought and they're perfectly capable of taking care of themselves, then I wouldn't even call them hypothermic. I would going on, and I would leave them just like that and, and just take care of the heat loss. They'll warm up themselves. Give them a little bit of fluid and those types of things, no problem. But when we get into mild hypothermia, we're starting to see some mild to moderate mental status changes. And, and if a good way of looking at that is, is like the, the umbles. Um, they're fumbling around, they're bumbling around. You know, they're, they're not making sense so much with their speech. Sometimes it's hard for them to talk to you. Okay, they're obviously going to be shivering. They're going to have that shell core effect. And their core temperatures, if you could take a core temperature, is about at 35 to 32 C. So right about 95 degrees or sub 95 to 90 degrees is what we're talking about there, Fahrenheit. Let's talk about temperatures here for a little bit. I don't recommend that you uh, really start to look at numbers as far as trading your patients in, in hypothermia. Okay, if you could have a... Uh, a thermometer that you could drop to the area of the carina, okay, down the esophagus, and get a good core temperature that way. I, that I'm perfectly okay with that. There are three ways that we typically take temperatures. Um, we take them orally, we take them axillary, and we take them rectally. All of which, in the winter, are going to be of no value to you. Now, with that said, if you get a patient that's cold, you think they're cold, you think they're hypothermic, you put an oral temperature in, and it comes back at 97 degrees, I'm all right. I, I believe that, okay? 
I'm not. A, I don't have a problem with that because if it's overly warm, then I'm. I'm. You know what? I think it's good as long as your, your thermometer's working. You're taking all the temperature. It's 90. Comes back 97, 98 degrees. Okay, he's not hypothermic. The ones I worry about is when you you take that oil temperature, you take the rectal temperature, or you take that axillary temperature, and they come back at at 70 degrees, and you think, my God, this guy's severely hypothermic. Yet he's talking to me. Okay, when we shell core shunt, and when we shell core shunt, that includes your rectum. Okay, so. Think of your rectum as, as something that's far out of your body. It's not getting good blood supply. It's kind of like your ear gets shut off when you get really cold. Your body doesn't need the blood in its, in its bowel, okay? Just like when you're bleeding, it doesn't need the, the, the blood there. That's why we listen to bowel sounds when somebody's got a trauma. If they're working, then we know that they're still getting perfusion that way, so they're better off than if they were. In this case, the bowel gets shut off, okay, and it becomes very cold. So if you were to take that core temperature being a, a rectal temperature, you're going to get a false reading on it, okay? And you're not going to get an accurate depiction of what this patient is. You're going to get a comeback of cold temperature. Or in all honesty, what we see in a lot of cases here, we see people sticking the thermometer in there. They don't stick it in far enough, um, okay? Because to, to get it in really far enough, you almost have to lose it. Um, and, and that's not a good thing, okay? So... When we look at this stuff, you know, you, you put this temperature in, there's a lot of times we'll put it into a piece of feces as well. Uh, and our body's not in the habit of, of maintaining core temperature to its feces when it gets cold. Okay, so there's a good chance you're going to get an inaccurate reading with that. Um, so we can't really rely on any of those three things. And in fact, the myth of, of uh, you, you, you take your oral temperature and typically your rectal temperature is one degree warmer than that. And then your axillary temperature is one degree cooler than that. It's really been proven to be completely false. Um, you can have variances of four degrees, um, so they're really not that accurate. Um, any of the, the, the temporal scanners and those types of things, I would not use uh, in the environment. Okay, if you're in the back of the ambulance and it's a well-heated ambulance and that thermometer is okay, that's fine. But if the patient's wet at all, um, do not rely on those things. You're not going to get an accurate reading at all. Okay, so so be careful with that. Um, so what we do is we give you mental status. Okay, like I said, if the person is completely alert and talking to you um, and they can care for themselves, they can, they can move up their clothing, they can, they can get out of their cold clothing, get into new clothing, get out of their wet stuff, get into dry stuff, um, and they can eat and those types of things, I don't even really consider them hypothermic at this point. I do what that is. Um, when we get into the mild hypothermia now, this is when people start to have the mild and me the moderate uh, mental status changes. Okay, so now we're starting to see those fumbles, those almost those fumbles, okay? And these people will progress to severe hypothermia if we don't stop the heat loss mechanisms, okay? So we, we definitely have to make sure that we're taking care of that, okay? Um, mild hypothermia can be acute. It could be real rapid onset if somebody hits the water kind of thing. Um, but typically, we can see these things over long periods of time, too, as long periods of exposure. Um, or they could be the subacute, like I talked about, the long time period, that type of thing. All right, so that's your mild hypothermia patients. How do we take care of our mild hypothermia patients? We uh, immediately start to do the field rewarming. Okay, so we stop all the heat loss mechanisms. So stop the heat loss from convection, conduction, and radiation. It's good to start trapping that heat, put them in sleeping bags, put them in tarps, those type of things. Stop that the thing, get them dry, get them some stuff to eat and drink, okay, um, and then make sure that we're taking care of them. The one thing that we really want to stay away from is, is doing too much um, as far as exercise goes, because you think that exercise is a really good thing for these people, but the problem that we run into with exercise is an after drop. Again, we can see a significant after drop, so we can take someone from mild hypothermia and turn right into severe hypothermia if we're not careful. So please be careful with that. Uh, we, we used to recommend something called feed them and beat them. So we would get them up, we would feed them, um, get them some calories, and then we'd get them up and exercise them, and then we found that we were starting to cause some temperatures to drop real rapidly. Um, in that after drop phenomenon. So we want to make sure that we don't do that. We want to keep them in the sleeping bag until they're fully alert again. They feel more uh, warmth, um, and then we can get them out and start to slowly exercise them. Um, so for us in our in our EMS system, understand it takes someone that's um, been in a real cold environment and you put them into the back of your ambulance, you are going to see some sort of after drop. Okay, so they may not be shivering when you put them in the ambulance, but then they may start to sh start to significantly shiver once you're in the back of the ambulance. And that's, you're just seeing proof positive there that uh, people are having an after drop. So they may have gone from maybe 96 degrees and then they drop below that 95 and they start shivering uncontrollably. It's not that you're doing anything wrong. Um, put blankets or 
trap that heat in from the shivering. Let them shiver. Don't try to stop it. Don't, you know, um, encourage them to not do it. Just let them shiver, and they'll shiver themselves back into warmth. It's kind of a hard slide to understand, but uh, if you look at it, um, if you look at the start, the cooling time there um, up at the top, um, as you come down there, it, it's, what it's demonstrating is, is how significant some of the, the after drops are. Kind of a tough one to explain over the over the phone kind of deal. But if you look at invasive heat um, all the way down at the end cooling and then it goes rapidly up there, that's a big time after drop. So that's like putting someone in the water. And we, again, we don't want to do those things. So let's gradually warm them up instead of trying to get them on for warm up. Quick. We talked about the calories and fluids, so we definitely want to get those type of things into them as soon as possible. Obviously, if someone that can't drink, okay, um, if, you, if you have something that's completely altered or unresponsive or something, um, then they're in severe hypothermia, and obviously we're not going to be able to, to um, give them calories and fluids. Um, let's look at severe hypothermia at this point. When we talk about the difference between severe hypothermia and mild hypothermia, where we're at now is, and I hope you guys are familiar with the AFU, so uh, awake, uh, a verbal, painful, or, or unresponsive on, the, on that scale. I'm sure you guys are probably aware of that. We're starting to talk, this person is getting very cold now. They're below 90 degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> okay, so they're starting to see significant metabolic problems. Okay, if we're not real careful with these people, um, we're not sure exactly where it hits, but somewhere around that 88, 87, 86 degree point, we start to see the, the likelihood of ventricular fibrillation happening. Um, and once we go into V-fib uh, based on a cold heart, it's virtually impossible to get them out. Um, for you paramedics that are out there, um, make sure that you get these people on monitors as quickly as possible. Um, you may see vital signs of heart rates that may be uh, somewhere around 20, somewhere down to maybe even 10 or 12, okay? For you guys that are first responders and ENTs that don't have that availability with the uh, monitors, sometimes the AEDs even have an oscilloscope on so you can actually see the heartbeat. Um, if you're going to take uh, vital signs on these people, uh, they are very, very tough to, to identify. Okay, very tough to find a carotid pulse, very tough to certainly find a radial pulse or a femoral pulse. So you really want to try to listen, um, get as much as you, you get people to get quiet, and then try to take the get an pulse on them. Paramedics, um, there's a docs, whoever's out there that's got the use of monitors. Um, put your monitor on these people, watch for the heart rate. As you're watching the oscilloscope and watching the, uh, the EKGs, um, looking for the, the QRSs, then make sure that you're uh, also listening apically and make sure these people have pulses. <clears throat> There's a lot of controversy if somebody goes uh, pulseless without um, with being severely hypothermic on whether we should do, um, you know, CPR, whether we should do um, defibrillations and those type of things. I have to refer to your own protocols in that. Um, what we recommend basically, and in, in coming from Canada and, and Alaska's guidelines, basically if someone's unresponsive, has no pulse, um, and they're severely hypothermic, we recommend trying to ventilate them first for a minute. After you or check a pulse for a full minute, if you can't find a pulse after a full minute, then start to ventilate them for a minute. Um, and then after that minute, check again for a pulse. And at that point, they have no pulse, then you can go ahead and start CPR. Um, understand that, you know, the CPR rates are the same, those type of things. Defibrillation has not been proven to work, even in some of the dog labs and those type of things. They don't have real good luck with defibrillating these people. I know our protocol down here says try shocking one time and then transport the people. The problem with that is that we're close to hospitals. We are we're within 10, 15 minutes in most cases of a, a major hospital around here that we can get good help in where you guys don't necessarily have that option. You could be a long time out. So there's, there's a good chance that you guys will, will deal with these people long term. Be very careful with moving them. Um, even in some uh, cases, uh, enough to a uh, small drop on this patient, you know, taking their from a semi uh, fowler's position down to a, a supine patient and dropping the chest kind of thing down, you got to be very careful because that's enough to cause that heart to go into ventricular fibrillation. And, and again, we don't have very good luck with these people if we, if we go into be fib. So right, when we evacuate them, make sure that you're doing, you know, taking care of all the heat loss things. Don't, don't let that heat loss out. Understand that someone that's severely hyperthermic, they cannot be treated in the field. If you're mildly hypothermic, you are perfectly okay to treat those people out in the field, get them warm again, and they can stay out where they're at. With these severely hyperthermic people, they definitely have to be transported to the hospital. Okay, um, so please understand that uh, the difference between the two of them really is that mental status. And, and it's not, if you, if you can take a good accurate temperature, go ahead and do it. But if you can't and you don't have the equipment to do it, 
go by mental status. Okay, someone that's completely alert, knows exactly what's going on, cares for themselves, and they are fer- they are certainly just cold and let them let them care for themselves, get them in the warm stuff. If they're mildly hypothermic, they got some confusion, they got some things going on with the mental status, then make sure you take care of the heat loss, get them some warm drinks, um, keep their heat up until you can start to move them eventually. And but when someone is uh, is less than A on that ASCU, when they're starting to be uh, P or U on that ASCU, um, these people are severely hypothermic. And please uh, use extreme caution with moving these people. In fact, when we talk about pulling people out of the water, we want to try to pull them out horizontally and not prone. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the future, too. Okay, so when do we not work these people out? You know, this, you can read the slide. You know, it, obviously, chest is frozen. I mean, you can't move it with CPR kind of thing, and that's frozen through and through. Uh, the lethal injuries, you know, the, the head injuries, those type of things that are obviously lethal any other time they're going to be lethal with somebody that's cold too. Our recommendation is submerge under water for more than an hour. We know that there's been cases where people have come out for longer than an hour. If you have the resources, no one's going to tell you not to work those people. We're perfectly, we're, um, perfectly good with that. You know, if, if you if you have limited resources and the person's been under water for an hour, that's kind of the accepted norm um, for the for the wilderness stuff as well as the uh, urban um, type EMS stuff. Okay, um, we use something called a hypothermia package or a hypo wrap, we call it. And if you look at this person in this picture, that's like a tarp or a, or a uh, some sort of sleeping bag over top of them. Okay, so that's taking care of all those four heat loss mechanisms. We have enough padding and insulation underneath them. We have enough air that's being trapped. Um, we're keeping them from evaporating their heat loss, and we're certainly keeping them from uh, convective heat loss um, in the uh, winch of there. Okay, so we're in the, in the cold environment there. So this would be a good way to transport your patients, um, even in the back of the ambulance with the heat. And please remember, and this is where I think we fail miserably as paramedics and, and stuff like that, is that we, when we're out in these car wrecks, you know, we're getting our equipment set up. We're warm because we have coats on and stuff like that. We cut the patient's clothing off, and we still expose them to the cold. We're still being exposed to all these heat loss mechanisms sitting in their car. So please get the blankets on. Please take care of the heat, uh, the, the wind, and those type of things. Keep your patient from getting hypothermic and not being able to clot. I think that's something that we really need to concentrate better on. Um, if you look at this slide here, uh, you know, look down at the bottom, uh, 100 disease, the higher hypothermia, so go all the way to the right, and then look down at the bottom of hypothermia, that's the triple X's there, the double X's um, in, in, as far as treatment and effectiveness, and you see that there are double X's. That's really, really bad stuff there. And then if you can see that, it's not, I guess, not on that slide there, but how we treat these people in the hospital is there's fen fen is the hemodialysis. Um, they'll take the blood out of the person, run it through a, an ECMO machine or something like that, and they'll bring it back um, warmed up through, uh, you know, so they can they can do that effectively in the hospitals. There's no way of doing that pre-hospital. You can't do any of that stuff. But if you look at uh, pre-hospital fire, like heat source, a lot of people think that fire, and you see this stuff on these TV shows and stuff like that, where fire is a good thing for hypothermia. Well, it's not. You don't get good, uh, you don't get good heat that way. So about chemical packs, a lot of us have those baby warmers kind of thing in our trucks um, and these chemical heat packs that we could use. Um, I'm okay with them, and most people will try to tell you to put them in the groin, put them in the axle left, put them in the neck and stuff like that. Well, our recommendation is that you concentrate heavily on the chest area because that's where we know through uh, scientific experiments that we gain most of our heat. So if you had all those hand warmer packs and stuff like that, that's fine. Go ahead and put those, per- those things on. Just don't attach them directly to the skin. Leave a T-shirt or something like that, and put it uh, uh, put it right on the chest wall, um, and then that way you'll you'll get some heat back in that way. That's all decent stuff, but don't think that you're going to warm somebody back up that way. You know, electric blankets that's great. You know, if you have warm humidified O2, that's something that we do, but most of us aren't carrying those type of things, um, so we we don't have the uh, the availability of that. So really, for us, getting them in the warm ambulance, expecting them to drop the temperature a little bit more, um, getting them dry. Um, and then transporting them, I think, is, is, our, is our best bet there. Okay, so let's talk about what happens when we go into the cold water. All right, and, and I can tell you that I've done this on at least probably a dozen different occasions or, you know, half a dozen or a dozen different occasions where I actually go in the cold water to do this. And, and it's, it's not a necessarily a pleasant experience, um, but when you, the first thing that you do when you hit that uh, cold water is that, and, and you guys have probably all done this before, and I say guys, I apologize to the ladies out there, I mean both, um, so you, you, the guys and the gals out there. When you when you go in there and you turn the shower on, you go to a hotel that you're not familiar with or they have that water messed up, um, and you turn it on, you hit that cold water, and that cold water hits you. It's one of the most obnoxious stimuli to your body, and the first thing that you do is you shock and you gasp. You literally 
you gasp for air. Um, and if you stay in that water, uh, you know, if you hit the cold water, typically what happens is that you hyperventilate. Um, and you're going to hyperventilate it for a good probably 30 seconds to a minute. Because I have a little bit of experience with it, um, I'm, I'm, I can usually get my breathing in control in right around that 30 seconds. But I can guarantee every time I go into the cold water, and I usually go in with just a kayak top and, a, and uh, some shorts on, um, I, I hyperventilate. Okay, now hyperventilation, if you hit the water and you go under the water, um, the hyperventilation leads then to drowning. It's certainly not, people are not dying from hyperthermia when they hit the cold water immediately, despite the myths that are out there, despite all the, the, cold, the TV shows, despite all the news, despite all the, you know, those type of things that keeps telling you differently. It's simply not true. Okay, so most people, when they hit that cold water, they have that cold shock phenomenon, and that lasts again for about a minute. But you can't swim at that point either because we coordinate exercise, we coordinate our limb movement with our breathing. And if your breathing's all out of whack, your limb movement's going to all be out of whack. So you're not going to be able to... Um, uh, you know, swim very well or anything like that. So really understand this is going to happen to you. Um, you hit the cold water, get your breathing under control, stop the hyperventilation, and just kind of relax a little bit, okay? We'll move down to cold incapacitation, and that's about 5 to 15 minutes, okay? And what we see with cold incapacitation then is that we will um, have about a good 5 to 15 minutes-ish, depending on the person, Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter, okay, that this person will be capable of exercise. In other words, self-extricating themselves from the ice. Okay, after that 5 to 15 minute point, you know, they start to lose that ability because their nerves are getting cold. Their nerves get cold, they don't get the blood and the oxygen that they need because of the base constriction, and they're no longer very valuable to them. Um, everyone's been probably cold enough so that you couldn't move your hands very effectively and try to grab your zipper and those types of things. That's the same thing, cold and incapacitation. Again, 5 to 15 minutes-ish. I've seen it last about 30 minutes in people where they actually will take 30 minutes before they start to have that inability to do that. Okay, again, it all depends on the person. Bigger people, you know, heavier people, um, you know, obesity is, is your ally in this case if you, because you have a lot more layers to go through. Um, but the thin people, again, these are the ones that we're going to be more concerned about because they're going to be more likely to lose heat quickly. And then we finally get down to hypothermia, and hypothermia then is at, at least that 30 minutes, and generally up to 90 minutes before we start to see anyone die of, of hypothermia, where we go into the point where we're hypothermic and we don't respond to it. Because it's a long time down there. It's way past that five-minute point. Okay, so, you know, please get that out of, of, of the norm, and we need to start thinking better than that. And then finally down to circumrescue collapse. And what circumrescue collapse is, it's something that's a little bit uh, misunderstood by people. I mean, sometimes uh, in a lot of cases, people don't hear uh, even hear about it. What we know is that when we <clears throat> are under stress and we're in a, a survival situation, we go into the cold, we'll go back to that fisherman, and that fisherman's in the cold, and he's starting to panic because he, he, he goes in, he gets that cold water, hyperventilates, and he goes in that cold incapacitation, and you arrive there 15 minutes later. You tell him to sit up on the ice, get as far up on the ice, and we're going to rescue you. We're going to get to you. I promise we're going to get to you. Well, as he's in that water, he's definitely cold. He's definitely scared. He's definitely have a, a bunch of adrenaline dumping into him, causing all that basic constriction and everything else. Okay, it's maintaining his blood pressure. The water, actually, the tension on the water is actually helping maintain his blood pressure too. Okay, so we know that when we get these people right towards rescue, right before they get to rescue, okay, sometimes they will relax. If they relax, okay, then what happens is that they lose that epinephrine dump and they can actually drop their blood pressure significantly. They can actually drop their heart rate significantly. And we see that, um, unfortunately, fairly commonly in, say, like the North Atlantic where the Coast Guard will go to rescue somebody and they used to rescue people by just dropping a, a ring down, okay, and put the person in and they would pull them out. And what they were finding, and that's why they use baskets now, they'll drop the basket down so the person can come out horizontally and not vertically because we know as, we, as the person comes out vertically, um, that can cause pressure problems and push the pressure towards their feet rather than put towards their heads where they need it. And again, then we end up with the, the circulation coming back to the heart. We can end up with a colder person than what we had to. So that's that circumrescue collapse. And, and we don't have time, unfortunately, to talk too much about that as we rescue people. But please understand, I think for us, is that we want to rescue those people um, by pulling them out onto the ice horizontally, if at all possible, and try to keep them horizontal um, to keep the blood flow going to the brain and those types of things. You don't want to necessarily stand somebody up quickly because you're going to have a single blood so more than likely if, you, if you've been in the cold water for a long period of time. And then just to, to reiterate that, that when you hit the cold water, okay, you're going to 
um, have that gasping hyperventilation kind of thing. And that usually is about that one minute point. And most people can get that under control. If they don't get it under control and they start to panic, okay, that's where you start to see these people drown. In that case of what we were talking about early on there, certainly they drowned. They didn't die of, of hypothermia. They drowned. And that's in, in the strong majority of the cases here, that's, that, that's what happens. Uh, we lost a good friend of ours a couple of years ago in August. Um, and uh, he was out. Uh, on Lake Michigan, and he was going from uh, Grand Haven to, to down here to Holland. So it's been a long trip, and, and he got warm. Was, like I said, it was in August, so he decided to go swimming, pull the boat over, um, jumped into deep water, so there's no, no issue that way, but he went in head first and didn't, hit, didn't cause any trauma or anything like that. He came up one time, and uh, he gasped for air, and then he went back down. So, of course, um, everyone that was on the boat thought immediately hypothermia, that was the problem, which unfortunately it's not the problem. And what happened is that he drowned basically because of, uh, he hyperventilated. Hyperventilate underwater to take in a bunch of water in your lungs and drown. Um, and unfortunately, and unfortunately, that was the case with him too, that he, he drowned and didn't die of hypothermia. Okay, so it was just minutes that he was actually in the water and then they lost sight of him and he, went, he never came back up. Um, so again, that's within the first minute or two. And, and he, you know, there's no problem, you know, as far as the hypothermia thing, it just doesn't exist at that, that close. Even in the coldest of waters, even the water is really moving quickly, you're going to have more than 30 minutes typically. Um, like polar dips, okay, a lot of people will do these uh, um, polar bear plunges and those type of things. Understand that when we do hit that cold water, we have a massive vase constriction that goes on as well, okay? And when you have that uh, massive vase constriction, that puts a great deal of pressure on your heart. If you have heart conditions, okay, if you've had a, a previous heart history, or someone that may be borderline heart problems, then they can really cause them to have some uh, significant, uh, you know, cardio problems, um, including MIs and those type of things. So uh, they, they keep doing the polar plunges, which I'm perfectly okay with them doing. Uh, I wish they would screen them a little bit better and ask them if they have any um, cardiac uh, history because they go in and get the cardiac episodes and damn off. So you would certainly see that as, as a call um, sometime in your future too. Um, certainly perfectly safe. Again, you know, for some reason, people believe that within five minutes you're going to go hypothermic, but we see all these polar bear plunges and people in and out of the water all the time, and no one gets hypothermic, and they're, and they're not all medical miracles. They're not. Um, this isn't the greatest picture of me, I guess, but um, this is down in the, in the Fenville area, and you can see we cut through the ice, um, and, and when we do it, we have divers and stuff like that, so there's actually, you can see the three divers there, and, and, and I have a PFD on, so you can see that I'm, I'm taking all the safety measures, and there's a, there's a safety line attached to me. Um, so the divers have uh, me attached and then also, um, you know, I'm perfectly safe there. Now, obviously, the, you can imagine the water temperature is probably right around that 32, 34 degrees, you know, or just a, maybe just above that, 36 degrees. And I'll go in the water here, and this is the, the initial picture where I'm, I'm actually hyperventilating here, trying to get my breathing under control. And then um, it's, it's usually something that we can, you know, uh, then once I get under control, I'll sit there for probably another, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, to show people that they really can stay okay without um, getting too crazy. All right, we talked about all this stuff here, so I think we're doing we're doing pretty good here. Um, the circumrescue collapse kind of thing, um, we talked about that. I, I hope if you have questions, please ask those um, as we go into the question and answer period. Um, and we know that this, and this is kind of one of the closing slides here. Um, People may or may not ask you for recommendations uh, as far as the ice goes. Understand that all water in Michigan, virtually all year round, is cold water. And we consider cold water anything really around 68 degrees, 70 degrees, and, and, and colder than that. So even even a lot of the year, you know, almost till August or so, Lake Michigan is typically a, a cold water environment. So please, 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 if you're going to have people out on boats, if you're going to have, you're going to be out doing rescues, you're going to do any of those sort of things. Please, by all means, I hope that you um, are wearing PFDs because if you go through the water um, and you, you can easily survive the, the hyperventilation if you have a PFD on because your head's going to stay above the water. Okay, you may, you may cough and hack a little bit, but man, I tell you, if you're wearing the PFDs, and this we strongly, strongly recommend, um, is that you're always wearing those things when you're near and, and active by the water. <clears throat> because please understand that, you know, even, even in, in, in June or July, um, significant temperatures could be you know, the, the water temperature can be significant to cause this cold water uh, instance, okay? Two to four inches is good for ice fishing, you know, walking. Two inches the less they offer, that kind of thing. But, you know, and then you can start to drive on it as, as far as the thickness goes. We'll start seeing these now, maybe a little bit late in the season doing this one, but 
Um, you know, we're, we're supposed to get some snow here. We're supposed to get some cooler temperatures, so the ice is going to come back on the lakes. It's not going to be very thick, and we're having a good possibility of, of doing this thing or having somebody go through the water and do that, okay? Remember with hypothermia, you can see this in, in your patients that uh, fall outside, you know, you can and have the prolonged period of time. And it wasn't too long ago in Petoskey, I was talking to one of the, my peers that we teach with up there, and he's a nurse practitioner. He had a patient that uh, uh, she fell outside um, going to get mail, um, and she was out through the night. So she was out in excess of, uh, of 12 hours in nothing but a nightgown in uh, about 34 to 40 degree temperatures. She broke her hips, so she was unable to get up. And when they got her finally into the hospital and her family finally found her the next day, um, her core temperature is still only about 93 degrees. So she really never even dropped in the significant hypothermia. She was really only in the, in the mild stages of the hypothermia. Okay, now she did end up having some uh, coagopathy problems as far as the clotting goes, um, but they were able to fix that warm her back up and she did quite well. Um, so even though it's a long period of time, you can certainly have people that do okay. Um, but understand, again, the thinner people uh, are going to be more susceptible to it. Uh, so if you have multiple people in the water, please pick the ones out that are struggling to stay afloat. Then, then obviously go by size. Um, and, and we always, um, no matter what we're teaching in the wilderness medicine, we always try to give people the easiest way of looking at things. And that's level of consciousness. You know, if, if people are doing well and they're talking to you, then they're probably better off than the person that's obviously not talking to you or, or, or um, being confused. So I think that's something that we should always look at and, and, and do that. Okay, the 110 one principle um, refers to the three phases of cold water immersion. You have the uh, one minute to kind of um, get your breathing under control. You have 10 minutes of useful time kind of thing. And then you have about an hour before you become unconscious due to hypothermia. All right, so that's kind of an easy way to do it. And if you look at Gordon Giesbrecht stuff, um, you know, and you look at his videos, you just Google Gordon Giesbrecht um, or Dr. Popsicle is another one term that he goes by. You'll see his videos and he has a, good, a series of good uh, three videos. And that's kind of what we mimic when we go in the water. Um, he's, he does a cross country ski and he goes in the water and then he goes back in a couple times. But I would challenge you guys to watch that uh, when you get done here. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have it attached here, but it takes about, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes. There's too much time to go over it. So, um, please look at uh, his stuff, and, and I can spell that for you. It's, um, you know, and I'll go to the opening slide so you can see it there, and I'll leave that up. All right, so please don't panic when you hit that cold water, um, you know, or, or if you're treating somebody that, that hits the cold water. Tell them not to panic. Tell them to sit still, okay? Try to hold on to the ice. Um, we know for sure, if you look at the, even the, like the movie Titanic, stuff like that, um, we know for sure that people were, were still calling for help in the actual Titanic uh, for 60 minutes after being in the water. Um, so we know that that can certainly last that long, okay? So we have time. This is not an emergency if we get there and people are not struggling. If they're just sitting in the cold water, sitting on the ice trying to get out, stop them from panicking, okay? Do a safe rescue. Um, if you watch the video, he uses all kinds of things like ladders and sticks and and all kinds of different things um, to get these people out. Don't go out on the ice and try to think that you're going to be a hero yourself and go out and get them. The problem that we're seeing is that multiple people are drowning, just like in that convict lake thing, because they think, my God, they're hypothermic, and i got to get to them right away. If I don't get to them right away, they're going to die of hypothermia. That's certainly not the case. I mean, we should be able to make sure that we do that, all right? We should be able to get these people successfully treated. So again, we talked about the conduction and convection being the most important uh, heat loss mechanisms that we have in the cold water. Okay, so when, when somebody is in water, um, it's conduction and convection are the real problems. Remember the oral temperatures, the rectal temperatures, and scanning thermometers are, are, are really considered very accurate in the cold water or in the cold environments or even the environments, period. Okay, um, after drop, remember, we talked about those type of things. And then please, if we have a patient... Um, go by level of consciousness because you're not going to get an accurate temperature on these people unless you can drop a, 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 a thermometer down to the level of the carina down the esophagus. You're just simply not going to get an accurate temperature. Go by um, mental status. And if they're talking to you and they're making sense, um, then they're really just either mildly hypothermic or just cold. Um, if they're unresponsive and they're not talking to you, um, then they're probably severely hypothermic. And, and if you treat them that way, you're going to be very successful in treating your patients. Remember the four heat loss mechanisms, okay, and make sure that you treat those that way. Um, end title is good. Um, if you guys are paramedics are out there, if you have end title, that's probably a really good thing to put on these people. You'll see a low reading because you have low amount of circulation going on. Um, please put them on their monitors. Um, please, you know, make sure that you're um, doing it. 
Uh, warm on these are okay, but don't expect it to temperature up too highly, okay? Um, you're not going to be able to do that very well with just the warm IVs. When we talk about warm IVs, you're talking about 100 to 102 degrees, and that's kind of difficult for us to do, too. Um, we certainly don't recommend starting IVs on somebody that's in, in the cars. You know, if you're, going to, if you're going to push fluids on somebody because they need uh, fluids, if you're trapped in a car for a while, um, by all means, give them the fluid challenges uh, via syringe, but don't give them, uh, don't let the IV just sit there and get cold because um, you will um, successfully drop a core temperature um, if you if you put a cold IV into somebody. Um, and it's how they, you know, that's how they drop the core temperature sometimes with a, with a heart attack type things too, with a cardiac arrest. Um, remember, don't put these people in, in hot water, all right? Anyone that's mildly or severely hypothermic, do not put them in, in hot water. Their hypothalamus is sitting in that, uh, in that warm blood, okay, and it's going to take its impulses from the cold, uh, from the cold skin, and when you put that warm water on that cold skin, it's going to open up all, all those vessels again, and all those vessels that are trapped with a bunch of potassium and a bunch of bad things that are going to go back to the heart, they're going to cause the heart to get colder, and the heart's going to um, get more irritable, and there's a good chance that you're going to put those people into ventricular fibrillation. So please do not put them into, into uh, uh, warm baths. Okay, it's just not the way to go. It's simply not the right treatment. Okay, I'll go uh, to on the, and I'll use this one here, um, and you can see um, Gordon Geese Rex um, show our our name there, and then you can uh, you can get his stuff there. And please, I, like I said, um, you can. Uh, Go to his his website. He's got a lot of great information. He's really the, the foremost expert on this stuff. Um, he's got a cold water boot camp that yeah, you can buy videos for and those type of things. He's really, really a great guy to talk to. Um, his email and those type of things are on there. You can certainly get a hold of him and talk to him and stuff like that. He's from a uh, real, real nice guy. Um, and then, uh, obviously, um, Emma, we can open it up to questions at this point. All right. Thank you, Tim. That was a wonderful presentation. I will go ahead and unmute the lines. If anybody has any questions um, for Tim at this time, please um, speak up. Oh, these, uh... I have gone and unmuted all the lines. If anybody has any questions for Tim, please go ahead and ask them. <clears throat> Tim, do you have any questions for the participants on the line? No, I, I, I hope that they got something out of it, is, is, is what I can only hope for. I know I did. Um, you know, like I said to you before, Tim, I don't have um, an EMS background of any sorts until I started a position here at the center, um, and I thought that was a really um, – educational webinar there's a lot of so i really enjoyed it well if anybody um has any questions for tim uh, maybe once the webinar is over um i can provide you um with tim's email if that's okay with you tim absolutely okay um, and again, just to let everybody know, you will have until Monday, March 7th, 2016, or two weeks from tonight, to um, fill out your attendance form, your evaluation, and quiz, which I will send to you directly after the webinar has concluded. Um, and if you have any questions in regards to that, please let me know. Again, phone number is 517-355-7757. Five seven. Or you can email me at Emma E M M A dot Smyth S M Y T H E A H C dot M S U dot E D U. And again, this webinar has been recorded tonight, and I will be posting it on the Michigan Center for Rural Health website as soon as I can convert it to our YouTube page. Um, and if there's no other questions or comments at this time, I would like to thank Tim again for taking his time tonight to present on such a beneficial um, topic for EMS, especially during this um, frigid winter. We are supposed to get six inches of snow in the Lansing area on Wednesday, so uh, I thought it was a very appropriate topic, Tim. Can I ask a question? 
Can I ask a quick question? Sure, go ahead. Please state your first name. My name is Jamie. I'm a paramedic up in Marquette. Okay, Jamie, go ahead. <laughs> I was just curious if anyone has heard anything about like a deep suctioning with drowning after you get them innovated. If there's lots of water, if it's worth doing. I'm sorry, Jamie. I, I guess I didn't hear your question right. With with the cold water drownings, or just drownings what? after you get the patients intubated, if there's a lot of water, is there any sense of doing deep suctioning of that to try and get some of that water out of their lungs? Yeah, you know, in, in any of the drownings, um, you know, it, it, we can get as much water out as possible, obviously. Um, in fact, if you guys have CPAP, um, they're running CPAP effectively with uh, drownings now, too. And it, it doesn't even necessarily take into this point. Um, you know, if you can intubate, that's fine. Um, understand that you're going to blow the water out of there. Um, there used to be a big belief that uh, fresh water would cross the membranes quickly and get into the blood and cause infections, and that salt water would cause uh, massive pulmonary edema. Um, they they uh -huh. kind of moved the now. Um, and, and they really want to try to get as much ventilation as possible. Understanding that you're going to have to, have to make sure you're really high. Like you're going to lose some of that and you're going to, you're going to have some surfactant problems and those type of things. Um, but they're having really good luck with putting CPAP on somebody really quickly if they're breathing on their own. I mean, if they're not breathing on their own, then I would go ahead and, um, and, and suck them whenever you can. You know, obviously, limited time doing that and concentrating mainly on, on uh, ventilating the patients. Yeah. And, uh, you guys have Entitle? Do we have Entitle? Yes. Yeah, Entitle is, is really the wave of the future and, and probably really good for all these people to see where they're at. Because um, that way you'll know if they're, if they're still perfusing well and stuff like that. As far as the deep, deep suction, I mean, yeah, get water as you possibly can out. But, you know, I think that it's uh, real appropriate to, to ventilate um, as well as possible, too. And don't forget CPAP. It's it's great when these people are breathing on their own to keep the CPAP. Yeah, the few that I've had haven't been breathing, so I wasn't able to use it, CPAP on them. Uh, yeah, so that's really, that's really <laughs> but then make sure you're, you're also maintaining your core function. Um, you know, don't don't forget about that. And that's, uh, full, um, covered in from the wind and keep them from uh, getting any better. And, uh, you're losing, you're able to survive as well. I think we have a bad connection. I'm, you're breaking, you're in and out. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you, That's can you okay. Hear me now? okay. I can hear you now, good, yeah. Good, yeah. So I would, again, I would, the only suggestion other than that, than, than getting an intubator for not breathing and those type of things, is, is absolutely make sure you keep your core temperatures as. as uh, Warm as possible. Uh, don't forget yeah. that you've lost I think, again, that's something that we forget to do as EMS providers. That, cool. hey, just, thank, you. thank you for that. Yeah, you bet. Thank Any you. other questions out there? Are there any last minute questions for Tim at this time? All right. Well, thank you so much, Tim. That was a fantastic presentation. All right. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Okay. Okay. Well, right. thank you so much. This was a great, great webinar. And as far as I can see, it looks like you're getting some positive feedback in our chat box. So that's good news. Good. I can hear it. Well, all right, everyone, okay. I will go ahead and... Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> Is there a question out there? No? Okay. Well, at this time... Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. And I'm sure Tim is um, more than happy that he did it as well. Absolutely.
Well, all right, everyone. I hope everyone has a good night. And again, look for my email once the webinar um, is finished. And if for some reason I missed you, go ahead and shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, I'm not in my office tonight, but I will be back in tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, and again, um, make sure you get your attendance form, evaluation form, and quiz filled out um, two weeks from now or by March 7th. Thank you and have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Tim.